Russ and I have talked about this several times, and I suggested this as a topic because I don't, I am not a business person. Uh, and I mean, I, I haven't looked at innovations like, uh, like the business people do, but I thought it'll force me to do scientific analysis on innovations. And that by forcing myself to go uh, in front of people like Russ and Christian, it will force me to do due diligence and do, do this like I would do a scientific problem. So since then, I have spent um, quite a bit of time looking into it and um, um, essentially I've come up with some thoughts that I hope I'll be able to convince you about innovation. Um, if you go and talk to almost anyone in Harvard these days or any school, there's always almost like somebody called an in innovation officer. Uh, um, Almost every university has it, and I frankly don't know what they do. Uh, but even in, in corporations, you have innovation officers, and you have innovation institutes. So almost everybody says, I mean, from executive administrative people I have talked to in different universities, they are having innovation conferences and all that. And I'm going to show you a different perspective. And uh, this actually not only is it a different perspective, but it's also going to show you about what I think US is losing in innovations. And I will show you data because it's, I did it like a scientific talk. And I even use some, uh, some of the uh, ideas from machine learning. And I have some numbers which I'm going to show you. Uh, so this was put together just for this talk. A lot of these ideas, the first time I am presenting it outside, people have been asking me to write it up. Uh, it may happen. Uh, but the idea is that US is losing in innovations, and I'm going to show you what's the problem. And I don't have a solution, but I have some general suggestions. It's too complicated a problem, and I don't think a chief innovation officer is going to cut it. Um, but at least you will see some of it. I have actually four, um, four sections in my talk. I'm going to start with a background. Uh, I'm going to show you two sites. You will see what the two sites are. Then I'm going to show you why innovation is challenging. And I think you all think, and I thought, we know what this is. Um, but I will show you it's a, it's not as simple as you think, and then there are opportunities in any of these. So with that, let me go with the background. Like anything else, there are a few terms that need definition so that I can stick to the definition because I kind of brought this up here so that you will see what I'm going to talk about. First is the word science. Science has a Latin um, source from scientia, it means knowledge. So science essentially means knowledge. Engineering, on the other hand, is from ingenium, that is mental power. The same root as ingenious, and engineering has the same root. Technology is a Greek word, uh, which essentially says it's combining art and skill. And ology, the, word, the root ology, is the science itself. So the science of art and skill is what is called technology. So now people use all this interchangeably, which is why I wanted to put this out so that it's clear what I am talking about when I talk about innovation. Invention is an idea too. I know the red may not come out, but it's essentially a novel device method composition or process. When I file for a patent, that's what I'm filing for. But innovation is not that. I can have as many hundreds of patents. If, n if nothing is made out of it, it's not innovative. So it's not patents. It certainly are not publications. So these are the terms that you need to keep. So I'm going to start by saying that everything in the US is looking very good. The first part of it, both sides. So I will kind of take from Charles Dickens and say it's the best of times. Um, everything is good. Uh, so let me try to tell you that why I think US is the world leader. Because I have been in this country for 30 years, and I, I really feel good about a lot of things. And I'll tell you what are the things I feel good about. This is the ranking 
of the top 25 universities in the world. It is coming from a different, it's, uh, I looked at two different times, higher supplement and, um, and also the Shanghai rating. You can see UCLA is number 12. And the thing is, if you look at the 25 institutions, 70% are from United States. So if you look at where education happens, from university, these are research rankings, and that's why Caltech is very high. And you can actually see that all of that happens in the United States. 70% of the institutions with about 5% of the population, which is a pretty good thing, which shows that US leadership, you'd agree on that. Now, if you look at the Nobel laureates till 2015, US still leads with 353 Nobel laureates. So here also US has a leadership. Um, and even if you if you make it per capita, that number even goes up even higher. Okay, so universities and also the scientific recognition. Now, if you look at the most profitable companies in the world, here also U.S. is actually pretty good. Uh, Thirty-six percent are from U.S. with again five percent of the population, which is quite good. Uh, the total profits of all these companies add up to 528 billion euros of 2012. So, you know, for practical purposes, you could say it's 530 to 550 US billion dollars profits. So, if you look at that, you know, generally US is um, the most profitable companies. Certainly, US takes a big role in that. Now, if you look at the job geographical distribution of startups, I kind of highlighted the places where there are no big universities I could talk of, but most of the other places have universities. So essentially, if you, these are the biggest starting, the rate of new entrepreneurship. This ranked in 2014. There's a 2014 rank and there's a 2015 rank. And you can see that the usual suspects are very high. Austin, Silicon Valley, Cambridge, um, and Southern California as well. You can see that, all, I mean, the Los Angeles Long Beach is number four. So this is where most of the company startups are going, going up. So now if you look at US research and development, it's going very high. 1960, the total US R&D is like about 400 billion dollars now. The, the key thing is it's split into four. The industry level uh, performance, you can, you can essentially ignore the university based thing, but those are good numbers to have. The key thing is the corporations, which is the green triangles, are taking up a big chunk of R&D. That's a sign. So all this is good news. So wh where is the bad news then? Okay, so everything I have given you says we are okay, everything is going up, every curve is going up, everywhere we are leading. So let's kind of go and look at which I would call the worst of times. So if you dig deep, you will see it is not as good as you thought it was, at least the numbers. I kind of uh, didn't show you everything. So let's dig a little deep and see. This is essentially the US <coughs> manufacturing reduction. The left is the share of the US employment. 86% of the employment in the US is in servicing, not in manufacturing anything. And that includes finance industry. So all the people are mainly working in the service, not in creating products, 86%. But if you look at the S&P 500, 68% is in manufacturing. So what does that mean? Which means most of the manufacturing is done outside US. Nobel prizes, best universities, everything looked good, but the corporations are profitable. R&D is good, very good, but manufacturing is outside. 
one illustration, 95% of the rare earths that is used in US, which is used in wind, magnets, and it's photovoltaics, batteries, are from outside US. 95% of the rare earths US uses is from outside. And the only rare earth company in US is trading for less than a dollar in NASDAQ and has declared bankruptcy last. So the only mining company here, not because we don't have rare earths, because the business model was not conducive enough to profits. So no mining. So rare earths, every new technology, including iPhone, which uses like eight different rare earth elements, are have to come from outside or manufactured outside. So let's look at something else. R&D investment outflow. So <coughs> the red here means it's going out. How much is flowing out from one year to the next? This is taken from the EU industrial R&D investment scorecard. Green means it's positive. On the left side is US. 8% is coming out, 52% is going out, coming in, 52% is going out. European Union, 22% is coming out, coming in, 26% is going out. So a differential of 4%. Look at US, 44% in, in deficit. The Asian, on the other hand, in is 9%, out is 3%, which means a net positive, the only surplus. This is R&D, not manufacturing. OK. That means that the US is paying, US is investing in R&D and that's being performed in other countries? Yes, exactly. That's why those numbers need to be put in context. When companies show them and say everything is going well, it's trickier than that. Now, I just want to look at one more example. These are plots of different industries taken from Thomson Reuters uh, 2014 top 100 innovative companies. This chart essentially has different industries. I don't know whether you can read it, but the first is US, second is European Union, and the bottom here is China, Japan, um, South Korea and Taiwan. The US has a pointed, you can see that pointed chart? Only in the semiconductor and software industries where all the innovations are going on in US. Look at Europe, it's much more broader, and Asia is almost broader. If it were really broad, you would want this, this figure to be going like the circle. The more it touches the wall on all the sides, which means you have a totally balanced thing, but you don't. What's the units of the radius? It is some normalization unit that they have used up to 10. So this is just a... So it's just to show the balance. There, right. right. And the, the, the key thing is, I mean, it's... The problem is I didn't replot it. The right way to do it is replot it because if you look at the scales, the scales are different. I don't like to plot these kind of things. But if you look at it, the US is so pointed. And if you look at the entire IT revolution and why the US has been so good in the last 20 years, why Silicon Valley picked up is that pointed chart. That's where everybody was putting attention. That's why Silicon Valley innovation just took off is because of that point. While the rest of them are growing more organically and like, you know, on all the directions. So this is, remember, this is the worst of times. So there are a lot more issues and I'm going to show you. Look at the fraction of US patents. I, I told you US is doing very well. It has dropped below 50% for the first time. And the chart is going down, which means Outside the US, more patents are being filed than in US. This is not just patents. I have data on publications. That's also US has lost the edge that it had. Right? Now, remember I showed you this? 
this looked like good news, right? The US R&D. So I'm going to replot it, and I will tell you why. So all the corporations are putting the R&D. So corporations are all doing the right thing, right? That's what it looks. And uh, I think as Russ pointed out, it is being done outside. But even otherwise, this is a healthy thing. If you are a corporation, would you not agree? Right? If you looked at this plot. I replot this, the same plot, but with different Y scale. So if you look at it, the profits essentially has gone. You know, you need to look at the number. It has essentially gone um, from about 55, or, or you could call 75 to about $450 billion R&D. That looks pretty good, right? The same plot, but I did it. In the same time, do you know how much the corporation's profits went? I am giving you a hint by changing the scale. <laughs> this is how much their profits went. So the R&D doesn't look that high compared to this chart, right? If I showed you that the other chart, it would look like it's growing, but it's not proportional to profit. And we will try to answer why some of this is happening as I go through. Background of economics and so forth. My first thought is: Are your numbers inflation adjusted? Yes. Sort of normalized, right? The that could be not really. That's right. That's right. The R and D is inflation adjusted. The R and D is inflation adjusted. I think the profits. I, my, uh, I, I'm trying to recollect. I took it from the Fred data, and uh, so they are typically inflation adjusted. I, I remember the R&D is uh, inflation adjusted. I'm not sure the profits are. But all I wanted to show was on the scale wise, it's different. And in, I, I mean, what I wanted to do was to subtract out the inflation and show, look at both the numbers, but which I didn't do. It's interesting that you're focusing on profit and not revenue right. as a factor of this, because profit's derivative, which is a result of like inefficient or something like that. But revenue kind of represents a sort of a different kind of way of looking at it relative to your investment. Right. Do you have revenue? Do you, do you have assessments? Right. I, I did have the revenue. The reason I didn't show the revenues, and, and you, you will see why when I'm going to show you the next plot. The R&D to revenue correlation is pretty strong. They correlate with each other very well. Because being able to drive more profit and you still have the same percentage of R and D and so forth. Says you're actually doing very well. Right. I mean, that's at least what I'm triggered. Right. Right. What you think about? Right. But the point I wanted to mention is, you are keep and I'm, when I get into more and more drill down, you will see the message gets more and more complex and tortuous. But the point I wanted to say is, if corporations were I mean, I was in the corporation. Uh, if the corporations were to come and say, oh, we are spending all this R&D, the point I'm trying to make it is, and I will show you something else to tell, tell you. So there is a, there's a cash balance, right? If so much money is being made, and I'm spending the same percentage, which is a small fraction, where is the money going? So, so you're asking the question of, well, if you have this surplus, right? Uh, are you why aren't you choosing to plow it back in? Exactly. 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 And I have the answer for it, which is why I set it up with a profit, not revenue. That, that, that's interesting. Okay. So now let's talk about the challenges. And now, um, so this is essentially taken from 2,000 companies worldwide, 2012 data. Profits versus capital expenditure. There's a pretty good correlation, you would agree, right? I mean, it's, it's still there is a scatter, but you can see the trend. Now, this is profits versus sales. And there is also a pretty good correlation, even though R squared is small, but it's, it's still a good number. You can see the trend. Now, if I show you R and D, there's no correlation. And the reason is I put the R squared there to show you the correlation to compare it with the previous one. 
not only is there a correlation, this, this shows a trend which is disturbing. A company with one-tenth the R&D, R&D is on the x-axis, can have the same profit because the, look, at, look at some of those blue or purple diamonds on the left side, over 100. It has the same y-axis as the ones on the right. So in other words, I could be spending 10 times the R&D or one-tenth of the R&D and could still end up with the approximately same profit. Okay. So this is showing a trend. I mean, of course, you still see it's going up, but it's less of a trend. There is a lot more to this trend, but I will not go into it now, But because the point I want to make is something else. So let's look at the top 25 companies in 2012, ranked by R&D. You can all recognize the top company, right? Um, and. And you could, I mean, I had the same US classification as well. This is in Euro, so this is like $9 billion, $9.5 billion. These are the companies ranked by R&D, the highest R&D to the, the top 25, okay. Now look at profits. These are the companies which are making all the profit. Many of the ones you saw before probably are not here. But some other companies, Apple is the second most profitable. ExxonMobil is the highest profitable, but Apple wasn't here. OK? <clears throat> so now, I showed you two things. They are making a lot of profits, but their R&D is going up. So where is the money going? So this is a chart of the buyback of shares taken from Fortune, uh, February 2015. The y-axis is in billions of dollars. This is where the corporate is about 550 billion is going in buyback. Corporate share buybacks for profit companies buying in the open market. So just to tell you how these numbers are. I actually took a quote from Bloomberg. S&P 500 companies spent almost all the profits on buying back the shares. $914 billion on share buybacks. Remember the R&D number? That was $400 billion. 900 for a year, or 95% of the earnings are essentially going into buying this. So this was the point I wanted to make, that uh, there is a bigger share of money going into buying the sh from the share, uh, buying the shares back in the open market. So the, the whole point of that is, the reason I put it under it is not good times is the money is not necessarily all going investment into R&D as it should. So now, now let's kind of go and look at what actually is innovation. And I want to kind of go through examples. So innovation, I think we went through the definition, but I just summarized it here. It, is it for it to go from theory and concept to some societal application? So you want it to go into an application for someone else. And I thought this was the nice figure that captured what, I mean, you need to have some car running on the road for you, you to call that car an innovation. Not sufficient, it's an idea in your mind, you have patent filed or a paper published. So I'm going to show you three examples of innovation. It is not what we think of as one item. The first one, one taken from each one I wanted to show you is Andrew Carnegie, uh, who is very well known. Uh, entrepreneur, and this is essentially his point was not to come up with steel, but essentially to come up with a steel rolling mill, and steel production and control of the industry became the source of his fortune. So this is essentially a picture of the rolling mill. 
just the steel rolling mill was the innovation that Carnegie said. So that is one innovation. I, am, I have about seven of them, but I'm going to show you only three because they are relevant to this today's thing. The second is Stanford University, I think is, is, is another, in my mind, a manifestation of innovation, mainly done by Fred Terman, who was the dean. And he essentially said cross-fertilization between academic and industrial research was important. And he did many items. And I have picked up four different, actually five different items, what he did. And you will see how it ties in with the rest of the talk. The Hewlett and Packard were his students. He encouraged them to continue their research in the industry after leaving the university. In 1943, he submitted a plan for 20 years to greatness. And 46, Stanford Research Institute, SRI, was incorporated as a separate entity. In 1950, he was able to convince electronics companies to set up labs within 10 miles of Stanford campus in Palo Alto. In 1952, the Varian Associate, for the first time, he convinced his administrators that a company which just does R&D should be in the Stanford Park. So he essentially had the company provided incentives for the companies to do R&D in Stanford Park. So it's the second, in my mind, an example of a fantastic innovation, which is 1943. And now moving into this. I don't need to say much. I think uh, all of you know about this. But I thought I want to put some quotes on this. It is user experience that's innovative about iPhone, nothing else. And I will show you what it took to make it from a scientific perspective. But it is essentially the user experience. And I took these quotes from New York Times. Because I remember I was driving from Minneapolis to Des Moines during that recession when the US Secretary uh, of Treasury was requesting over $500 billion for uh, essentially bailing out. In the same news, as I was listening on public radio, they were saying people are lining up in Apple store to buy iPhone. So here, on one hand, there is this whole economy is kind of going. But on, in the same news piece, they are saying they can't understand it. In New York, there is this huge line in front of Apple store. So to me, that is exactly the definition of what an innovation is. And the quotes, I just took that because they essentially say it. He brought web browsing experience, fingertips, and used the iPhone. <coughs> then. The important thing is the last quote. How the things on the screen have a physics all their own. Lists scroll with the flick of your finger. CD covers flip over as you flick them. Email messages collapse. But it makes the phone fun to use. So this is actually innovation, which I don't think an innovation officer will get it. OK. So now let's look into. We talked about R&D. We talked about expenses. So now let's look at what would have been needed, the, all the components needed to make this iPhone. So I'm going to kind of go over it. And I have split it into about four slides. So you need to follow this through in order to kind of capture the conclusions. It has three components. What was the piece that was needed for iPhone? Where was it done? And which year was it done? OK, so these are all needed to make that iPhone come out in 2007. But what are the parts needed? So just there are three things. What it is, which year it is, where it is done. And this is important for the premise of what constitutes uh, innovation. Transistor, I think all of you know that. 1947, Bell Labs, New Jersey. Then 1958, planar integrated circuit, Texas Instruments, um, and also Fairchild, Santa Clara. 
uh, Bob Noyes was one of the people who went on to found uh, Intel and that. Then 1971 is the commercial microprocessor, Intel Mountain View, California. All these three would have been needed to get to the iPhone. But that's the integrated circuit part. But that's not sufficient. You also need an accelerometer. That essentially is 1943. It essentially happened in Denmark by a couple of scientists. And then the first company which essentially started selling it was based out of Pasadena, California. Then DRAM Cash, which essentially Robert Dennard at IBM Watson, Yorktown Heights, and then Intel made the first DRAM commercially available in Santa Clara, California. Okay, that was in 1970. Moving on, cellular networks. That was essentially developed in 1947 and 1971. Almost all of that happened in Bell Labs, New Jersey. Touch screen which was essentially developed at CERN. Then there's a team that worked in the University of Toronto. And Westerman, a PhD student, wrote a thesis in Delaware, who started a company which essentially was bought over by Apple. And that essentially went into it. So this touched Geneva, Switzerland, Toronto, Canada, and Wilmington, Delaware all the three components, OK? Not, not enough to make the iPhone. Liquid crystal display. The liquid crystal display has a more tortured history. It was discovered in Austria by a chemist. And then the patent application was by Marconi Telegraph Company, which tied into RCA. And then the RCA essentially used the electro-optic effects for thin film crystals. Then it was made based on a passive matrix at Brown Bavary in Switzerland. And then Hitachi engineers worked out the practical details of the IPS technology to interconnect the thin film transistor array for liquid crystals. So it went from Australia, Austria, Chemsford, UK, Princeton, New Jersey, Baden, Switzerland, Tokyo, Japan. It has two other nodes, which I didn't say. That one is in Russia, one is in Germany. But you get the picture. All these needed to have been done. And the point of how this innovation essentially comes about. Now, materials. This, the Gorilla Glass, which went into the front, was a project done by a couple of renegade engineers in Corning. It went nowhere. They found that a glass wouldn't break. When they dropped the glass, the glass would jump like plastic. But they, they couldn't find a place to do it in the 1950s. They couldn't sell it to anyone. They canned the project. They called it 0317. And then when Steve Jobs went and visited Corning, they resurrected that as Gorilla Glass. So that's a Corning New York innovation. Lithium ion battery, that was proposed in Exxon. OK, first lithium batteries. No. And then Professor John Goodenough uh, in Oxford at that time, and now in UT Austin, demonstrated a rechargeable battery with lithium ions. And Sony was the first one which introduced it. So you can see why an R&D investment doesn't necessarily correlate to profits now. Because Apple didn't do any of these things. Right? Now, I took this from an, a National Academy's report. I, I think they, do, they don't have the whole picture, but I wanted to show you this anyway. <coughs> National Academy's put out a report which said that Basic research is needed. So they took iPhone and essentially showed the things. And on the right side, I, this is something that I build on top of that, that all the other things which were done in corporations. So the academy's report was basic research is what enabled the things on the left. 
I would argue that the right side is as important as the left side. So the key point is basic research plays a critical role. But as I showed you, it is non-local. It doesn't happen in one place. Both government and non-government entities are involved. For example, somebody was funded out of an NSF fellowship, but he goes and starts a company which essentially goes in. So both government and non-government, it happens in a university and non-university. Corporations play a critical role, but it may not have any immediate business needs, like the corning glass I showed. It is not necessarily in their research lab. Sometimes it's out in the field that people come up with an idea. And that is the point. Now we talked about translation, what I call what facilitates innovation. But I'm going to show you the challenges. These are some of the things I have thought a little through it. But essentially, these are some of the issues that you have when you try to transfer a product from concept into something in the industry. There are the usual technical issues. Then you essentially have, um, so let, let me try to set this up. There are some things which is in the nexus of science and engineering. Some of the things you don't necessarily anticipate when you start putting things together, where it will. So I call them, you know, some of the gotchas type things which you don't. Then the last one, which is essentially external issues. You know, these things you can, most of them you can anticipate. This is something outside the control of any corporation or anyone. Marketplace changes. There's an attitude inside co corporations and companies tend to focus on execution. And there's an iteration between scientists and engineers that may not happen in every company. And it is longer than just innovation. So why did I put this out? I wanted to take the example, and I have done a lot of digging into this, is the recent Volkswagen issues. When they put out the diesel car, you can essentially map some of the issues they had to these things. They essentially tested it with the front wheels because they knew that they could not necessarily reach the goal the management had set out for them. Innovation rarely is top down. But it can also happen top down. Ford has, has done it. But you cannot always use that as a solution. There, they could not trade off the emissions versus fuel efficiency. So that is essentially the non-unique multiple properties. And also, they should have looked at the entire integrated automobile. Then the marketplace was changing because hybrid cars were coming. They started with diesel but it started becoming less relevant over time. And their corporate ecosystem was a little bit top down, even though they, are, they spend the biggest in R&D. So, so what are the lessons that we could take from what I have showed you? So I have tried to capture a few lessons, and I am sure you can look at things as well. Innovations actually involve more than a single person. I hope I have convinced you of that. Okay, so a chief innovation officer certainly can't do much because of the way both vision and execution matter. It's not sufficient. You have an idea, but you need to be able to do that. And passion and competition play a role. Why the startups are happening in certain places is not just chance. Then the chemistry of collaborators actually play a role, the kind of collaborators you have in that. Then in the short term, profits do not correlate with the research at all. And I have done more number crunching, which I didn't show you. The R&D to profit correlation, which I showed you, didn't exist. There is a very strong correlation if your company is very small. But large corporations, the correlation essentially goes away. And it makes sense, because having worked in one, I can see why that would happen. So the point I wanted to make is research plays different roles in large corporations compared to small companies. And customers generally are not able to see what they want. So when corporations tend to do market surveys and try to do it, they never would get innovation the traditional way. 
and then innovations are about translation and I, ecosystems and locations matter. You really need good universities. I showed you that startup thing and you can see that trend. There are always good universities around which these startups tend to happen. Good application needs, there should be compelling needs. There is indirect and direct role of federal research in all of them. You can't take them off. Serendipity and spontaneous connections matter as well. And I would call this, it's at the nexus of research and applica application. This is called the Pastors Quadrant. And I thought, you know, let's make it Americanized because Gibbs Quadrant is the right thing. And those of you who know the history of Gibbs, Gibbs was not recognized in the university. He was working till people across the country and even across the world were recognizing him. It was Einstein, essentially when somebody went from US to talk to him, he said, you know, you should go talk to Gibbs about it. The reason I picked up Gibbs were two reasons. Gibbs wasn't even paid a salary when he was working in Yale. He got the first PhD thesis in engineering in US. But if you look at American Mathematical Society, they have Gibbs lectureship. So he, he is one of the people who has been able to bridge theory and application. The face rule is something almost every metallurgist uses. To me, Gibbs represents this, this nexus of research and application as much as Pasteur's quadrant. And it's asymmetric. Research may not drive application, but application can drive research, and it's non-local. And I wanted to do that. So what are the suggested pathways? Focus not just on innovations, but on inno uh, not just on inventions and discoveries, but also on innovations. It is actually a solvable problem. You need science times engineering. And that's why I really like IPAM, because IPAM, I think Russ and his team have been able to do this time and again um, to bring people from both sides to talk to each other here. And then I would see going forward future computing as an enabler, because automation, data analysis, and prediction helps us with things, and nanotechnology as an enabler as well. So what is it I am suggesting? I have a few higher level suggestions. I haven't thought through it, and I would be open if you have any suggestions. I think that the basic research going to universities should be increased, not keeping with inflation. It should be doubled. Because if you look at how much it's contributing, it's non-linearly contributing. So trying to have R&D as a proxy or a substitute for basic research from the federal government, I don't think is sufficient. So I think the university should have. And then in addition, the government and the industry, if they are so interested, should have translational initiatives that essentially convert it from ideas into practice. And industry generally gets R&D tax credit. And you see what was happening. They get the R&D. They do it in one place and manufacture it elsewhere. Uh, my suggestion is it should be removed and substituted with translational tax credit. So where the ideas were translated. So, so then you could ask me, oh, OK, if I took out the R&D tax credit, who will do the research? That's why I'm saying double the university, or even more than two. I don't have the exact number, but I'm, I will probably, as I think through it, I will get that. Then the national labs, which do basic and applied research, also should get funding. So the whole point of this is this, in my mind, a proposed path will work. And I want to conclude this. So why innovation? The process of putting ideas into useful form and bringing them into market is the true engine of economic growth. If you don't have innovation, if you become a service economy, the economic growth will not essentially happen, no matter which country it is. Then the second thing is the European Union says, for great ideas to be turned into products and services will bring our economy job and growth. So I want to end it with two quotes. 
about innovation. And I showed you with data, but these people, I don't know whether they had the data when they said it, but they are right on. This is a quote uh, from Steve Jobs. Innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars you have, which is what I showed you. When Apple came up with Mac, IBM was spending 100 times more on R&D. It's not about money. It's about the people you have, how you are led, and how much you get it. OK? Then the other quote is from Bill Buxton. Innovation is not about invention, which I tried to make it. But these quotes I saw like today. Uh, so I captured it because it reinforced it. But these quotes, I, I really like them. And Bill, Bill Buxton's uh, quote, there's an article in Bloomberg on it. But the bulk of the work and creativity is in that idea's augmentation and refinement. The newer the idea, the coarser the granularity. So it is not just the idea. Getting that idea to work is what innovation is. So that should be the focus. And that is not going to happen in corporate offices and in innovation corners. It is a little bit more spread. And you know, I have, I have even thoughts about this. It is behaving like a very complex organism. It builds on itself. And it just grows back and forth. So you can only facilitate that. You cannot control it. So the facilitation mechanisms is what I try to do. So I will end it with this.